Well, good afternoon, everybody. Could I, could I ask people to move close? The reason is I'm going to be showing you charts that are kind of detailed, and I want you to be able to see it. And so if you don't mind coming a little closer, it would be, it'd be make it easier, I think, for you, and a little bit easier for me, too. So thank you. Uh, my name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president of uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's a think tank in Washington, D.C., traditionally a defense think tank. Um, our, you know, the definition of defense is changing. Uh, my, my boss, Tom Pritzker, has uh, been helping us rethink what national security means. Uh, and that was in part the provenance for the program this, that I'm going to show you now. This is, uh, we, we call it America's new frontier. It's really the world's new frontier. It isn't just for America. And what we look at in this is five forces that are so big, none of you can see it, none of us could see it, but they're going to affect all of our lives in very powerful ways. We only have time today for, to do three of them, but the three that I'm going to go through are foundational. So if you'll just bear with me, let's go. Uh, I should also say Liz Pulver, who's in the back, she's running the electrons. She's the genius that put this together. So if everything looks good, it's her, it's not me. Let's, uh, let's go to the next chart, please. Okay, we're going to look at demography. And let, go ahead, Liz, let's go to the... Um, but let me just set the stage here, you know, that um, we've been living in a remarkable time in history. Um, this shows the population of the world. Obviously, we're starting back here in 1820. Back here, 90% of the world was in extreme poverty. We actually have fewer people today living in extreme poverty than we had in 1820. And we've had a, uh, the population has increased by eightfold. It's been a remarkable thing. This is an unusual time in history. We've never, I mean, prior to this period, you could go back to when cavemen were munching on mastodon spare ribs, you know? And they were all in extreme poverty. It's only been in the last 50 years that we've seen this remarkable flowering where people have become rich. Now, it's not everybody, of course. Now, we're going to explore a little bit of this. I'll, this is a reference chart because we're going to come back and talk about this downstream in the presentation. Okay. Now, hold it right there, Liz, because I need to explain the chart. This is what it's called a demographer's pyramid. Uh, are people familiar with, it, with these? Okay. This is the world's population, roughly 8 billion people in the world today. Each one of these slices is a five-year increment. Okay, so these are babies to five-year-old, five to 10, 10 to 15, you get the picture, okay? This is the band of workers. It's everybody considered over 15 below the age of 60. This, or 65, this, so this is the working population. This is gonna be an important thing we'll come back to as we go downstream. Now we have, we have you know, men on the right, women on the left, Right now, there are about 350 million male babies, okay? About 330 million female babies. We, you know, the nature gives us more men because we tend to kill each other, you know, wars and drive motorcycles and, you know, we kill, we kill ourselves. So, you know, the nature gives us a few more men. If you look up here, women start to dominate. Now, we're going to run this forward in time. Go ahead, Liz, let's, let's run this forward. Keep an eye on these numbers. This is the global population, and we're going to go out to the end of the century. Okay, now, a couple things. We're now at 10.3, 10.4 billion people in the world. It'll never get bigger than that. It'll never get bigger than that. See how this taper in at the bottom? As long as that's tapering in, population is going to contract over time, but it's going to take time. Also notice the working band. That used to be 65%. It's now less than 60%. 
So we're seeing an aging phenomenon in the world. Okay, let's go to the next chart. Now, this masks a bigger story. We're going to look at five different places here. Uh, why don't you freeze it right there, Liz? We're obviously, we're looking at the United States. We always have to look at ourselves. We're gonna look at Africa, India, China, and the rest of the world. Okay, now let's run this forward. Okay, interesting. What we, what we see is Africa, that was 1.4 billion people, 1.4 billion today. It'll become almost 4 billion people by the end of the century. China, everybody knows this story. China today is about 1.4 billion people. It's going to drop down to 777 million. Now, the, by the way, all this data is from the United Nations data center, the demography center. So, and these are the most likely forecasts. Um, the rest of the world stays roughly the same. India stays roughly the same. Africa is where we're seeing this incredible growth, okay? And I don't know if we can see it here. Do, do, you, do you have one more step on it, Liz, where we show that Nigeria is bigger than the United States? We may not have that, it may not show up on this. This story is going to shape the rest of this presentation. We are going to see a remarkable transition in the world, and it's going to affect us all. Now, let's, again, let's take a step down to say what's going on, what's happening here. There are three things that really account for population change. Freeze it right there, please, Liz. Um, what, I'm look, what we're looking at here, and again, I have to explain these charts. This is the number of babies born per fertile female. Okay, now this is an arithmetic scale. On this axis is per capita income. It's a logarithmic scale. So this is $1,000 per year, $10,000 per year, $100,000 per year. Now, see the replacement rate. The replacement rate is that birth rate that's required in order for a population to sustain itself. If it's above that, the population grows. If it's below that, the population contracts. Okay, now let's run it forward. You see what's happening? The world is getting richer. And when the world gets richer, countries start dropping below the replacement rate. This is what's happening in China. It really isn't the one-child policy. It's that they become richer. So, yeah, keep going, Liz. Let's see if we can... Do you see the trend? It gets to $10,000 per year, and almost every country's birth rate goes below replacement rate. It's, it's a remarkable phenomenon. Now, also note here, all of the green dots are African countries, and their population is still above the replacement rate. That's why you're seeing this surge of births in Africa, where we go from 1.4 billion to nearly 4 billion people in the world. Now, there are three primary factors that contribute to declining birth rates. One is income, and as, as as people get more money, they don't necessarily have to have so many kids. The second factor is, is urbanization, uh, and we'll show that shortly. The third factor is women empowerment. When women get an education, they don't have as many babies. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is the urbanization rate. So it was back in 2007 when we had a crossover point, when more people lived in cities than lived in countryside. Now, why does that matter? Well, the marginal cost of having an extra kid when you're living in the countryside isn't that great. The marginal cost when you're living in a city is high. You, it's housing, it's transportation, it's education, all of those things, and this is what's happened in China. China is now a highly urbanized country. It used to be a rural country. It's now a highly urbanized country. So this is contributing to those collapsing birth rates. 
but not yet in Africa, because Africa is, still has that huge momentum that comes from having a big population of fertile females from the last 20 years that are carrying forward and are now being productive. Okay, okay. so what, very important to have this, this starting point. We are a, a richer world and countries are getting richer, but we're going to have a huge expansion in population and it's almost all going to be concentrated in Africa. All the growth is going to be in Africa. Now, what I'd like to turn to next, we're going to look at what is the significance of this for natural resources. First, let's look at water. This, remember, this is when population started to take off. This is water demand, and this is the annual withdrawal of water from available sources, rivers, aquifers, you know, we're, we're now taking this amount of, the population is exploding. The water is a, a finite resource. You know, you got potable water comes in, wastewater goes out, it gets recycled, you know. So it isn't that we're creating more, but we're using more of it every year. Now, let's go to the next chart, please. This is, this is a complicated chart. This is a chart that shows, I don't know if you can see this down here. This is the, it's called a stress index. This is, it, when it gets down here, deep purple or deep red, this is where we're taking over 80% of the available water stock every year. So anytime you have a drought, like here in the West, we're in trouble. Colorado River's in trouble. Okay, because we're taking so much water out of the system. It gets replenished, but you have a crisis. And see where this is? It's both at the most highly populated area and it's in the temperate zone where temperatures are rising because of climate change. Okay, now let's, let's, let's go to the... What happens when people get richer is they want three things. They want higher quality food, and in most cultures that means animal protein. They want air conditioning and they want personal transportation. Those are the three things universally that people around the world want when they get richer. Now let's look at, at this is about the amount of water it takes to produce animal protein. Beef, I mean this is the, this is the killer, you know. Americans aren't the only people that love beef, you know. We just consume enormous quantities of beef in this country, and the water, 70% of all water is used for agriculture, okay. So as people want higher quality protein, they are, it's a greater draw on the available water stocks. Okay, let's, let's, I want to show you, well, hold it just a second, Liz, if you can, if you can go back. This is, we're going to look at patterns of meat consumption. This is that case where as people get richer, they want more animal protein. Okay, let's just run it, Liz. See what's happening? This is, again, that logarithmic scale, $100,000 $100, per capita income, $10,000. $10, see how it's moving up? It's a pattern you'll see around the world. There are a few places, you know, India is a little different because of their vegetarian religious foundation. Some Buddhists, same way. But by and large, you're seeing huge consumption of water because of, of the demand for higher quality protein, animal protein. So, population's getting bigger. The population is getting richer. It can afford more quality things, and one of the things is animal protein, and it's going to put pressure on the environment. It's going to put pressure on water. Okay, let's take a look at energy. This is a very interesting story. Let's, okay, let's hold it right here, just for a second. Note the, this is the, remember we saw that chart initially, the growth in per capita GDP? 
Okay, this is what's happened with energy. It's not quite as steep, and that's because we've become more efficient on how we use energy. But you're still seeing an enormous increase in energy consumption around the world. By the way, only 40% of Africans have access to electricity on a daily basis. You know, so this is, things are going to be changing. Now, I want to show you, this, this comes from the International Energy Agency, and we're looking at three different scenarios. It's their scenarios. This is where we are with current policies around the world. Okay, this is where people have said what they're going to promise to do under, because of their climate change pro promises. And this is what would it take to be to net zero. So we'd have no increase in carbon loading in the, in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Right now, we're doing, as a nation, or as, a, as a globe, we're doing pretty well. 40% is renewable by, the end, by, 50, by 2050. But that means 60% is still hydrocarbons, okay? Even as we go to everybody's pledge, we're still going to have too much hydrocarbon pumped into the atmosphere. And it's only this, and I don't think anybody thinks this is even close to being on the chart, where we're going to have climate change going to be frozen. Now we want to take a deeper look. Let's go to the next chart. Okay, we're going to look at fossil fuels. And, you know, there's good news here, and there's troubling news here. Uh, this is oil, gas, and coal. You know, you can see by 2020, coal consumption is coming down, but coal consumption is still going to be high at the end of the, at, by the 2050. Again, these are the same data from the International Energy Agency. Look at gas. And by the way, I, sh I should have said, the OECD, these are rich countries, so the blue are the rich countries, the green are the poor countries in the world, and China, we, we called out China separately because it's so huge. See how China, it has primarily been burning coal, and it still is a massive coal burner. By the end of, by 2050, they'll still burn more coal than the rest of the world combined. Okay, we have a major problem. With, with, coal, uh, with coal still being a fundamental um, resource for, for uh, in China and around the world. So the population's getting bigger, the population's getting richer, the population wants good quality protein, and they also want energy. This is the world that we're looking at. So, what are we going to do as a, as, a climb, as, a, as a global community? Let's go to the next chart. Now these are, this is a shorthand. We're going to have enough time for, for questions and answers. The demographic patterns in the world are fundamentally changing everything. And it's going to affect all of our lives unequivocally. And, and demography is absolutely certain to happen. This is not a forecast. The energy stuff is a forecast. The water stuff is a forecast. Demography is not a forecast. That will happen. It's going to put great stress on water and on energy consumption. And it's going to be part of our new reality. Do we have a coherent water strategy for America? No. It's, it's just not in the charts. Actually, it's one of the greatest problems the world could solve but we don't have a strategy for it. Energy is going to grow dramatically and we're, it's going to have an impact on climate change. I mean, I've, everybody here I'm sure is concerned about the climate. You better be concerned about Africa because Africa is going to be driving this. So technology is going to offer, I, I'm not showing the charts here on technology. Technology is going to have a huge impact and a positive impact. But technology is skewed towards rich people, not poor people. You know, it's, that's the way that you get market value with your invention. Be, very few inventions are going to be going to Africa to help them be more efficient in using energy, for example. So 
So the, we will see some benefit from technology. I think the great power competition, this is the fifth topic. We're not going to talk about it today, but um, our policies, we, we just listened to the China discussion this morning. What wasn't said is I think we're right on the edge of are we going to divide the world into two camps? That really is an issue in front of us, and it has an enormous impact here. Forty years ago, the number one trading partner for every African country was either Europe or the United States. Today, it's China. Okay. We are not prevailing with our, our agenda in Africa. Uh, the president of Ghana once told me, he said, you know, you Americans give me le lectures and the Chinese give me money. You know, we're really good at giving lectures to the world, but we're not coming to countries and offering solutions to their problems. So I, I think we need, to, we need to think about this great power competition, not just in the context of our rivalry with China, but are we offering a compelling model to the rest of the world? And especially the part of the world that's going to make a difference for our lives, and that's Africa. Africa is the weakest, uh, we have the weakest policy framework for Africa of any place in the world in the United States. It's the weakest bureau in the State Department, we have an Africa command in the Defense Department. The headquarters is located in Germany. Okay. We, don't, we have a very weak posture on Africa. We're going to have to get smart because I'd have to say the success of African leadership is going to determine our well-being going forward. We cannot ignore Africa any longer. Okay, let me just stop and see if this triggers any thoughts or questions or observations. Yes, please, sir. We have a microphone right, in, right down here. Thank you. Thank you. It seems so obvious to me, but obviously I'm misinformed. Why is the world not turning to desalinization uh, to provide that resource that we're going to need so yeah. badly? It's, there is a big push towards desalinization, but it costs seven times the amount of money. You know, so a, a, a gallon of water will cost seven times as much for a consumer compared to just pumping it out of the, out of the ground or taking it out of a river and filtering it, you know. So it's really a cost issue. Um, I think we could do a lot on um, become more efficient in how we use water. You know, drip irrigation is obviously far more efficient than these big sprinklers. When I fly home tonight from Denver, I'm going to look down all these big green blobs, you know, on the ground. I mean, I think we're using, we're draining the aquifer. I don't know how many of you saw this reference, but um, on Monday it was reported that the axis of the Earth, you know, the Earth is tilted at 22 and a half degrees off axis, you know, for, per, from true north. And it, it wobbled an extra foot, I mean, extra yard, because we've taken so much water out of the ground. I mean, it's, 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 it's astounding how much water we're using, and we're using it for agriculture. So there are things we could do, but when it comes to human consumption, it's price. And, you know, it's also, you know, water, we have something like 30,000 water districts in the United States. It's very hard to get a national program for that. On the coast, they're going to do something. I think I, I saw recently they were doing desalination probably coming up from the Gulf of Mexico as a, as a plan, but it's very expensive. Yes, sir, please. <clears throat> Thank you. This is fascinating. I wondered if you would talk about um, the inadequacy in China and whether history has to do with that, in that China could be seen in, in 40, 50 years' time as a kind of new colonial power, and America is concerned about its repeating old mistakes. Well, if, if, um, I want to make sure I understand uh, your observation uh, that uh, you're referring to the declining population in China and what it's going to do to their. Would, would you amplify, please? It'd help me. Sure. I mean, I, I get it that China doesn't necessarily lecture um, Africa in a way that perhaps America has done. Yeah. But still, with billions and billions invested, that is a power. Yeah. And it will become more manifest as, as, as we go on. I'm sorry. I, now I understand. You know, uh, um, 
Africa is, uh, you know, I mean, African countries, and I've talked to, you know, we, we have foreign ministers come through and all that sort of thing. I mean, they don't love the fact, the way that China acts in, in Africa. Um, but they offer, they're offering something to Africans that we don't. You know, we don't have a real uh, development strategy for Africa. We, we tend to come in and do symbolic projects. Uh, Africa, China will come in and finance, you know, a whole new railroad system. Now it's, you know, there's, we believe people are getting trapped by some of that, but we're not offering any alternative. And I think that's, are, are people happy about becoming dependent on China? No. And I think that China's One Belt, One Road program has largely fallen flat, you know, uh, so, but I don't think we should, I, I don't think we should take joy in the fact that people are unhappy with some of what China does in their countries when we're not offering another strategy or another solution. So I, I, um, I earlier this morning, one of the, one of the panelists said, you know, we just ought to be competing better. America needs to be competing better in the world rather than to try to drag China down. I think that's, and I think the rest of the world would probably want that from us. Yes, sir? There's a microphone right here. Just following up on the same question. Uh, from, what, uh, from my standpoint, there's a fundamental different approach, a financial structure, where America, all through the years, whether it was through the World Bank or other places, essentially gave loans, and in most cases, when the country couldn't pay back the loans, they forgave that, or they, you know, gave up on, they restructured it in various ways. China is giving long-term debt that accrues interest, and then it has a clause to flip to equity 10 or 20 years out. So China is ending up owning, like the deep sea port in, in, uh, uh, in, Sri, uh, Lanka. in uh, Sri Lanka, yeah. and it's doing all these things. So don't you think that we don't really have an answer to those new financial structures, which are essentially economic colonization, if you just compound it for long enough. Thank yeah. you. No, I think that's, that's, that's a very real criticism that's being offered. I, I personally think the, what we should be doing is helping countries um, learn or manage complex tender offerings more effectively than we do. You know, the, about 40 years ago, the World Bank did have um, a central office that helped uh, you know, a company or a country said, okay, if you're going to buy a whole new railroad system, how do you do a tender offering to get best value? We don't do that anymore. And I think that would be something that would be important to do. I don't think, you know, I mean, look, China does bribe some people, and so they get preferential access when they shouldn't. I think the only solution to that is transparency and then offer countries opportunities to understand how to get best value for themselves. If, if we help them get best value for themselves, they're going to opt for that over time. You'll, you will always, will always have corruption. I understand that. I think I've bored everybody. No, David here. So I'm just I'm going back to the picture that showed the population in Africa go up. Yeah. At the same, in the same time, the population of China coming down almost in half. Yes. What are the implications of that decrease well, in population in China, that I, on the world? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, look, I'm not a China expert, but I'm in the peak China camp. I personally think China is at its apogee of power. Um, I don't think they have um, a sustainable economic model. They have a development model that over invests in infrastructure. It, under, it, it provides too little resources to consumers so that you can get a sustained consumption base in the country, and it's very hard to change that. There's never, there's never been a case where a country that embraced a development model successfully converted to a consumption model. Um, so I think, you know, they're going to continue to build facilities that they don't need. There are enough empty apartments in China today to house all of France. There are, there are 17 million empty apartments in China. They, of, the four, of the 24 Shinkansen routes, or I mean the rapid rail routes that they've built, only three of them are cash flow positive. 
for, and, that's, and that does not include debt servicing. That's just current expenses. They have way over, overbuilt infrastructure, and it's, it's embedded in, frankly, the structure of how they've decided to modernize their economy. So now as they, as they age, you have two phenomena uh, with aging. One is you get fewer people, and more of them become dependents. But the bigger phenomena is, you know, people like me, my age, your age, Dave, we're no longer in the acquiring phase of life. We're kind of getting rid of stuff, right? You know, it's young people that invest and buy. They're buying houses, they're buying cars, they're buying suits. It's young people that are, are consumers. Old people like me, I'm trying to, well, I'd like to get into some of the old suits I have, but that'll <laughs> never happen, you know, but... Uh, but I'm just not buying stuff anymore. And that's, that's going to be a double burden for China because not only is their population going to come down to 700, 800 million, it's still a big number, but, a lot of, but increasingly it's an aging society. Right now, China is as old as the oldest state in the Union, Florida. And that's today. So they have, I think, a fairly... Now, they, they know it. The Chinese leadership knows it. Um, you know, the world invested in about two million robots, industrial robots last year. Half of them were in China. China knows what's coming. So they are, they are really doing some intelligent things given this phenomena, but it's unavoidable. I think we have a peak China in, in my personal view. Yes, sir, either one of these gentlemen. You haven't mentioned South America or any of the countries in South America in your analysis. I'd, I haven't, and, I, and that's, uh, that's a blank spot for me personally. Uh, so I, need to, I know that from a demographic standpoint, it's about neutral. It won't grow any larger. You know, Mexico today has a birth rate of about 1.4. Children per fertile female, you know, I mean, it's... I mean, it's, it's dropped significantly. They, they stopped at the replacement rate almost 15 years ago. That's really what NAFTA did. NAFTA brought up incomes in Mexico, so people didn't... I mean, we had more people return to Mexico for the last five years than we have come this way from Mexico. We want to get countries as rich as we can as soon as we can. And, but in, in, in South America, that's basically... The case. But I don't have that data in, you know, in hand. I'm sorry. This gentleman right here, Mr. Robert. Yeah, hi. Well, you got good eyesight. Uh, back to water. Uh, how efficient or inefficient are we being in terms of um, retaining the water, in retaining the uh, rainfall? We're not very efficient. And I mean, how can that be improved? It, well, you know, I mean, you know, the Anasazi Indians had a better water retention policy. 800 years ago than we have in Mexico, New Mexico today. I mean, we just have not put a priority to it because it's been fairly abundant and fairly f free. We're going to have to do a much better job of efficiency in how we apply water, especially in agriculture, and we're going to have to do a lot better job of, of catchments, you know, and we just don't do either of them very well. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, hi. Uh, great presentation. And two, want to go back to the demographic issues. In the U.S., if I recall correctly, you said that our population will go up it some. It goes up And modest. is that primarily or uh, immigration. relatedly immigration? It's immigration. And, so, and it, it seems like it's an important thing for us to continue to power the economy, et cetera. And yeah. so I wanted to hear you talk about that. And then in Africa, what is the conversation among leaders and governments and bodies there about this information? Are they like... Yay, we're going to be the biggest and this is going to make us powerful or oh my gosh or like what does it sound like what the conversations are? Thank you. You know, it's uh, again, I, um, the head of our Africa program was here yesterday. I wish he, he flew back this morning. I wish he were here to answer the question. I, I you know, I, 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 I don't think... You know, some countries know that they have a, a, um, a population problem. Nigeria has a population explosion problem and their feeding issues, that sort of thing. But there isn't, these are not st strong governments, you know. And um, there, so there, and it's also conflicted by 
ethnic and, and religious divide. You know, in Nigeria is a great fault line, you know, between Islam and Christianity, you know. And both of them see advantage in having bigger populations. And so right now, I don't think there's, a, there's no upwelling of population control in Africa. There's a natural population control that's emerging as countries get richer, as they become more urban, and as women get educations. The reason that the birth rate in Korea is below one, 0.98 I think it was, is because women are getting educations. And, you know, in c traditional Korean culture, this isn't quite the polite way to say it, but in traditional Korean culture, the wife would go into the husband's family's home to be the slave for her for his parents. That's the culture. And Korean women, educated, say, I don't need that. And it shows up in their birth rates. And they have a, they have a crisis coming. They're about 20 years ahead of where China is going to be. So everything, this is why, this is why I think China's demographic decline is almost certain. But to your question on Africa, I wish I, I wish I had more knowledge myself personally, but I don't, I don't hear that there are birth control agendas. It's happening because people are getting richer. That's the main phenomenon in urban. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the presentation and I'm just crystallizing one of the takeaways from it seems to be that China may be the principal U.S. kind of foreign policy issue of the next 10 to 20 years, but Africa is the principal issue over the next 60 to 80 yeah. years, yep. um, which is very interesting. It should be. Um, well, obviously your presentation has a global purview. I'm curious from your position in research, do you have any thoughts about what has been one of the other big themes of the conference this year, which is um, political uh, uh, if I can say disintegration, maybe that's too much, but but political uh, agitation in the United States and where you think the, the principal drivers of, of that are and where that's going. Well, I, um, I've got a lot of personal opinions, but I don't, but they are, they're personal and, and probably more visceral, not, not analytic and academic. I mean, I, I don't think we present the world a very compelling image these days. I don't think we're offering compelling answers to the world's problems these days. Um, the world looks at us and sees a fractious, disputatious political environment that's about zero-sum politics. It isn't about growth. We, we had a dinner last night at, at the Pritzkers and the question, neither party has a growth agenda. You know, progressives are worried about climate change. They don't want it to grow. You, you know, conservatives think growth is ESG and woke. You know, I mean, nobody's, you know, how are we going to pay for $33 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities without growth in this country? But we don't, ha we don't have a growth strategy. And the rest of the world, I think, kind of sees that. Um, we are not offering a compelling model to the rest of the world. We give them lectures, but we're not offering really the compelling model. Now, I think it's in our culture, in our nature, to be, to be generous people. I, I'm a very strong um, believer in um, humanitarian response because I think people's attitudes about us change when we do something to help them. I saw it happen in Indonesia when there was the, the uh, tsunami in Aceh. You know, before that happened, our national popularity ranking was about 10%. After we came in with re relief, it jumped up to 85%. I mean, if we, if we do what naturally is in our spirit, I think we can get back. I think we can become a leader in the world again. But we're not doing it right now in our politics. It's, I think, um, counterproductive to it. Now that's, these are personal views, so, you know, but I, I just, I just don't feel that we have an agenda that the world wants right now. Sir. Uh, so I think uh, the China scenario you painted is probably the best scenario for the U.S., but if I could paint a different scenario and get your opinion, 
So China goes from 1.5 billion to approximately half, 750 million, but they still have most of the consumer supply chains. Yeah. So they're very dependent. Uh, they want to supply to America and Europe today and for the next couple of decades, and they're very dependent on external demand. So if they economically uh, capitalize or even colonize Africa, which is going from whatever it was to about four billion, don't you, isn't there a kind of the equivalent of the British Raj or the British Commonwealth? Couldn't there be yeah, a Chinese yeah, Commonwealth no. or a Chinese Raj where they don't explicitly uh, govern the countries, but economically they remain a very powerful force competitive to U.S. interests? Thank you. No, I think uh, you, no, your, your observation's right. China is now the biggest trading partner for every country in Africa, and it's going to grow. They offer, frankly, less expensive. I mean, we sell Teslas. They sell electric vehicles that are $15,000. Okay, I mean, it's just, there's just such a price differential that in a, in a poor country with a rising economy, but still poor, China is, is going to have a preferential market. So we, again, we're going to have to really be smart here as we go forward. Yes, ma'am, please, can we, we've, we've, uh, we just want to make sure, well, we want to make sure the recording hears you. <laughs> so I was at the um, seminar led by your colleague yesterday oh, yes, uh -huh. about the Cold War. In November, Africa, yeah. And theme about Africa is very much the same. Yeah. Uh, so our policy is non-existent or not working. China isn't popular in Africa, even though yeah. they're, you know, trading with them, but yeah. As I think your colleague said, nobody wants to go to Shanghai. They want to go to New York. Uh, from out. So is there a compelling model by a country or any organization that we could emulate or learn from in Africa today? You know, uh, I wish, I guess, I wish Movember was here. He would, he would ha have more knowledge of it. I mean, uh, uh, countries that have important programs in Africa, Japan does. Japan actually has a fairly important development program. Now they usually put up a television tower so people will buy Sony televisions. I mean, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of self-serving quality to it, but, but they do have a constructive uh, agenda, development agenda. Um, the Nordic countries, uh, almost all of the Nordic countries have Big Brother arrangements with the foreign ministries to try to help them. I, I personally think that would be one pathway of getting better quality uh, tender offerings considered in a place like Africa is to have a Big Brother like uh, Canada, Norway, Sweden, you know, where they become a, 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 a mentor and a Big Brother. I think we have to invest in improving the quality of governance in Africa. But right now, it's filtered through our competition with China. So I think it's going to be other people that are going to lead the way. And I think Japan can be a leader in that. I think the Nordic countries can be a leader in that. The, the Dutch, are uh, they've got a complicated history in, in Indonesia, of course. But the Dutch have, I think, an, uh, a sophisticated approach on development. I think we're going to have to not want to make this our solution. I think if we have it to be a solution that the that the Western world offers, but we're not the lead, I think it, we're more likely to be successful. Yes, ma'am. So, as if we needed them, you've given us more reasons not to sleep at night. <laughs> Is there anything, one or two trends or things that are inherent to our society that you that, that give you hope about the oh, American future? Oh, yeah, no, I. Um, I am hugely uh, upbeat on uh, on technology and how it's going to transform the world. I'm in, I, 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 I'm on the board of a little company that is has the grand vision of trying to eliminate the threat of strokes in the world through interventional surgery done by a robot. Okay, imagine doing brain surgery with a robot. This is, and this is going to happen. It's, it's probably 10 years away, you know, but it is, it is going to happen. Uh, I think we have huge, huge opportunities that are coming our way from technology. Again, the problem is that technology is for rich countries, right? Because that's where you get returned. It isn't, you know, there will be a few 
brain surgery robots in Africa, but not that many, you know. But we're going we're gonna to find that it's going to solve the problem of rural health in America. You know, there, so there are great things like that that are coming. I'm very... Um, look, I mean, w women are having bigger voices around the world. And when women have bigger voices around the world, it tends to be a little bit, you know, you take the testosterone out of foreign policy, that's a pretty good thing, you know? Uh, and we're starting to see much more, much broader base around the world in, in leadership circles. Women are being accepted in that. I think that's a very positive development. Um, you know, um, lifespans have improved dramatically. Um, child mortality has, has really collapsed in many ways. It's been a wonderful thing. Part of the reason for the big explosion in population is because we've done such a good job on, on uh, childhood mortality. We've really lowered it. So there, there are very good things happening. It's, uh, it, there are not so many of them the product of government. You know, it tends to be more in the private sector. And so the question is, is how does the government help empower the private sector to bring these things forward on an accelerated basis? I think that's the new agenda for us in this country. Anything else? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, sir. Right here in the front. The development of fusion energy yeah. have on the future prospects? Look, I, I, um, there have been astounding advances in fusion power. Now, just this year is the first time we ever got more energy out of uh, a fusion reactor than we put into it. You know, most, most of the time we're, we put so much energy in and we're not even getting a net positive return on energy. We did for the first time this year. The big development has been uh, the improvement of supermagnets. That's, that's been the revolution. Now, there are about 50 different uh, fusion projects going around, around in the world right now. Um, and I think the advantage, of course, of fusion is you don't have radioactive byproduct stream that you have to live with for the rest of your life. Um, you, so I, I think fusion is a huge opportunity, but it's undoubtedly 25 years away. Now, it would dramatically transform, you know, the situation in Africa. You could get electricity out very inexpensively to a lot of people. Huge upfront capital costs. Now, if we can get the capital costs down, it would be different. Um, probably, but I also think we probably ought to be looking at small modular reactors as a solution in Africa in the short term. There's always a security issue that you have to, have to think through uh, with, with, with SMRs. Um, but I, I don't know how we're going to avoid the huge carbon loading that's going to come from current energy trends in Africa without really accelerating electricity. And then the question is, how do you generate it? And uh, I don't think we want to generate it by burning coal the way that China is doing it. I think we have to find a new way to generate electricity. And I think that's probably going to have to be nuclear. Yes, ma'am. Could you use that little microphone right there, please? Sorry. With India, I'm sorry if I missed this statistics, oh. growing at the rate it's growing and now surpassing China in population, smaller land mass, the arrival of AI that could displace a lot of basic jobs and capabilities, but also, I think as Arjun mentioned, uh, supply chains and everything is, will the world shift to India as a producer and a partner? What, what is your view, both economically but also from a population standpoint, on the future yeah. of India? In, India's birth rate has dropped below replacement rate, okay? And that happened about seven years ago, I think. But again, it has that huge momentum of fertile couples that are still going to be generating some population growth. Not dramatically, it's about 1.5 billion today. It'll go up to 1.6. But I don't think we're going to see it. It's not going to be like Africa. Uh, now, um, I think in, uh, look, I, India has boundless capacity if it can find an efficient legal system and it can find efficient ways to have foreign investment. 
and they've been holding themselves back. I mean, China's foreign direct investment is 40 times greater than that's been going into India. And a lot of that's because of the, of the government, the legal system. So if they were to reform that, I think they, the sky's the limit for India. They've got a huge population base. English is a natural language. They, they have, upside is tremendous, but they have government efficiency problems. Well, okay, I, my time's up. I just went to zero. I wanna say thank you. You've been very patient with me. Thank you. Thank you.